is watching us tonight and everyone that is listening to us on the God in Light prayer line and Bible study. We're just waiting for others to come on to the, to the uh, Facebook Live. Uh, but we are going to move forward and, and, and go ahead and preach and teach the word of the Lord tonight. Amen. I just want to thank the Lord again for his presence, for his glory, for the things that he's doing and the things that he's going to do for us tonight through the word of the Lord. Amen. We thank the Lord for Elder Marshall for singing the songs of Zion. We thank the Lord for our sister Gloria uh, for presiding over the, the uh, prayer line as she does every week. And we thank the Lord for, again for the Bannerman family, which we cannot uh, move forward without thanking them again for their vision as we always do every single week uh it seems like uh we we are just being able are able to meet people uh from around the country people that are different places of the world uh and have different experiences but yet still yet love the lord god almighty so we're just thanking the lord about every thing that he is doing and has done and for the many blessings that he has in store for us as the people of God. So we're going to move forward and as we pray. We're going to go right into the word of the Lord, which I believe the Lord has uh, given unto me for today for the people of the Lord. Amen. Amen. So let us pray. Father, we thank you. In the name of Jesus Christ, for this day, we thank you for your blessings. We thank you, God, for the great things that you have in store for us. Now, God, as we go into your word, open up our understanding. God, give us the grace and the ability to be sponges, to be soil that is good, that is well-nurtured, God, to receive the seed of the word so that the word will germinate, take root in our spirit, in our hearts, and in our minds, that we might live by it, abide by it, and that we might see the fruits of it in the name of Jesus Christ. Now, Father, send your anointing as always that makes teaching, as we state over and over again, profitable to the hearer as well as to the giver. Because God, without you blessing your word or blessing us to declare your word, then it's mute, it's a mute point. Because, God, the power comes through you backing up your word and your spirit, influencing the words that come out of our mouths. So, God, we pray in the name of Jesus again. Send your anointing that makes teaching and preaching profitable to all. In Jesus' great and mighty name we pray. Amen and amen. Tonight, we're going to be talking about something that was laid on my heart earlier today, uh, actually, when I was asking the Lord what to talk about tonight. But what the, one of the things that kept resounding in my spirit was the word mercy. And we're going to be looking at that tonight. We're going to be looking at the mercies of God. We're going to be looking at the mercy that we all are in need of. And we're going to talk about the mercy of God as it pertains to how that even influences our lives and our salvation experience. And we're going to talk about many other things associated with that if time permits. So we've already prayed. We're going to go to Psalms, the sixth chapter, the first verse to start off. With. Actually, we're going to read uh, the sixth chapter of Psalms in its entirety. It's ten short verses, and but yet it is the word of the Lord. So let us read. We're going to read again, starting at Psalms 6 and 1. It says, To the chief musician of Nagot, Nagot the Gino, excuse me, Upon Simoneth, a song of David. O Lord, rebuke me not in thine anger, neither chasten me in thy hot displeasure. Have mercy upon me, O Lord, for I am weak. O Lord, heal me, for my bones are vexed. My soul is also sore vexed, but thou, O Lord, how long? Return, O Lord. Deliver my soul. O oh, save me for thy mercy's sake. Return, O oh Lord. Deliver me. Deliver my soul. O oh, save me for thy mercy's sake. For in death there is no remembrance of thee. In the grave who shall praise or give thee thanks? As which is really states, I am weary with my groaning. All the night make I my bed to swim. I water my couch with my tears. Mine eye is consumed because of grief. It is waxed old because of mine enemies. Depart from me, all ye workers of iniquity. For the Lord hath heard the voice of my weeping. The Lord has heard my supplication. The Lord will receive my prayer. Let all my enemies be ashamed and sore vex. Let them return and be ashamed suddenly. And again, for emphasis, verse 
6 and verse 4. Have mercy upon me, O Lord, for I am weak. O Lord, heal me, for my bones are vexed. And 4, return, O Lord, deliver my soul. O save me for thy mercy's sakes. So when we look at the Psalms, we see that David, who was the pensman of this particular psalm, and the psalmist, was really in a place where he needed the mercies of the Lord to be extended unto him. And many times throughout the Psalms, you'll see this thing repeated over and over again throughout the Psalms. But yet, throughout the whole Bible in its entirety, from Genesis to Revelation, we see that the word mercy is repeated over 270 some times, which means that this is a rather significant topic. Whenever something is repeated over and over again by the mouth or the hand of the Lord through those who, whom he has inspired to teach it, there means that there is something to this thing. And most of us need to experience the mercies of the Lord. We need to experience the, the, the desire of the Lord towards us. We need to know that God is there and present for us. We need to know that mercies can be extended towards us. Oftentimes we don't fully understand and grasp what mercy means in, in its core or in its raw state. And many of us really again need to experience the mercies of the Lord and really walk in that mercy because we've not had mercy extended to us. We've had some form of mercies extended to us, but not the real in-depth desire that God desires for us to have. So let me give you start off with the definition of what mercy really means. It means extending leniency or commuting a sentence or forgiving someone who is worthy of death or worthy of punishment or worthy to suffer the consequences of the things of their own actions and their own behaviors. Things that they have done knowingly, have they have committed sinful acts, they have committed ways that are ungodly, they have committed acts against mankind or humanity that wasn't deserving of favor or mercy. And the thing was that, that in, in the Old Testament, everything that we ever did that was sinful was deserving of death. But mercy actually commutes the sentence of death to, to experience the favor of God. So when we talk about the mercies of God, when the scriptures say in Psalms 119, or, or the Psalms that talks about, Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, and his mercy endures forever. That person is actually speaking from the depths of their hearts, knowing what they should have experienced, but knowing the favor of God that was extended towards them by saying, you shall not die, but live, partially quoting a part of the scripture, which says that thou shall not die, but live and proclaim the word of the Lord. But yet God is telling us that we shall proclaim or that we shall live. And mercy is the reason why we live. So when we talk about mercy, we're talking about obtaining God's pity. We're talking about gaining God's loving kindness. We're talking about asking God for mercies, for provisions, and for things that we were not deserving of. But yet, because he is God, not because of any good that we have done, let's make that perfectly clear. There is nothing good that we can ever do to actually warrant receiving the mercies of God. All of our acts of righteousness are as filthy rags in the very presence of the Lord. But... God has predestined in his own mind, in his own spirit, and says that he is going to extend unto those who are less deserving of his favor and mercy because he wants to experience fellowship with us. We have to realize that sin separates us from the very heart and mind of God. It makes us God's enemies. We have become enemies of holiness. We have become enemies of righteousness. Whenever we practice or walk in, in willful sin or when we are unredeemed. Understand, God does not want you or I to be his enemies. He wants us to be his children in close covenant relationship. So mercy extends towards us 
a privilege that we were not born into receiving. Our birth by nature, born into sin, shaping in iniquity, separated us from the mind of God, the mercies of God, the desire of God, because of that sinful nature that was on the inside of us. But God in the New Testament extended the full and greatest measure of mercy towards us that we could ever receive. Understand that in the Old Testament, bulls and bullocks, goats and heifers, they could never bring us into the completeness of the fellowship that God wanted for us. We always have to offer those things continually, and any sin that we committed immediately separated us from God until we brought that sacrifice. But in the New Testament, the greatest measure of mercy that God extends towards us is Jesus Christ. That's why the Bible says in John 3, 16, that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. In other words, he gave his only greatest measure of mercy that he could afford. Jesus is the embodiment of God's love. He is the embodiment of God's mercy. And understand mercy means pity. God had pity on us. Jesus Christ experienced the full extent of what humanity goes through. The Bible says that he was tempted on all points, but yet he was without sin. So he can now become the great high priest of mercy and pity our experience. And the thing is, how many times have we felt pity for someone who has done wrong, who was caught in an act that they should not have been in in the first place, but yet we felt pity on them. We wanted to rescue them. We wanted to save them. We wanted to spare them the embarrassment. We wanted to spare them the, the, the penalties of what they did or things of that nature. We wanted to make sure that they receive leniency. Jesus Christ is the same way. Understand, he does not want anyone to perish. The Bible clearly states that, that he is not willing that any man perish, but he wants all men to come to redemption. He wants all men to come to salvation. And understand, in your sinful nature, God pities you. Listen, as preachers, I know we are so quick to teach people and to preach and declare brim, hell and brimstone. And we want to commit people to hell, but not mixing the mercy and the love of God and telling them how they can escape or why they need salvation. Don't tell me that I need salvation and you're not telling me what I need to be saved from it or need salvation for. I need to know why I need the mercies of God. The pitiful state that I am when I'm born into sin and shaped into iniquity, I am the servant of sin. I am the legal heir and property of Lucifer, the devil, Beelzebub. I am his property, not by design, not by the will or the mind of God, but the birth that I was born into causes me to become the legal property of Lucifer. Because the sinful nature and desire lives and resides on the inside. Until I am broken free or brought free from that particular spirit, then I am the property of the devil. The mercies of God causes him to pity us and to understand the ruthlessness of this hard taskmaster called Satan and Lucifer and sinfulness that we are existing under. That's why God talks to, to speaks to Moses for him to go down to Egypt and to speak these words to Pharaoh, let my people go. In the case of every single one of us, God has had the word of God speak to the spirits that holds us and to tell those spirits by the word of God when we hear the word of God. That's why it's so critical and so crucial that we listen and entertain the preached word of God. As a matter of fact, I think I shared it last week uh, when I was teaching that whenever a preacher 
a man or woman of God is standing up and delivering the word of God, and they are sanctified, holy, have prayed, they have fasted, they have studied the word, received the word of the Lord. There are angels on assignment ready to go out and minister to those who are the hearers. We should never take hearing of the word of God lightly. The Bible says, how can they hear unless they have hear from a preacher? And how can a preacher go unless they be sent? When a preacher is sent by God, they are on assignment. The assignment is very clear. The assignment is that God is looking to draw with loving kindness souls into his kingdom. God is not interested in someone going into hell in eternity lost and separating and apart from him. His whole mission, because if it were, he would not have sent Jesus Christ. Let me state that again. If he were concerned with that alone, he would not have sent Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the clear indicator that God is so willing to extend mercies into every last one of our lives. It does not matter what you have done. It does not matter who, what you have said. It does not matter who you did it with. It doesn't matter if you have it in your mind right now to go out and commit sin. It does not matter when God breaks through with the light of his word, when the word is preaching to your heart and it pricks your soul, it pricks your spirit, it pricks your heart, it pricks your mind. Change is inevitable. Change will come. Change will come because God has allowed the light of the gospel of Jesus Christ, which is the greatness of his mercy, to shine into your heart, to expose every dark area that is there. Everything that has been groped and grafted in darkness now has been exposed so that now the, the, the person whom the light has been exposed to can see what manner of man they are and understand listen, God extends mercy but he also wants us to understand and comprehend the pitiful state that we are in when sin has been exposed. Until we come to the point that we understand how depraved, how deprived we are because of what sin has done to us, crippled us, and has done so since our birth. Until the light of God's gospel shines in our hearts and illuminates the ill, we will not know how to cry out and because of the pitiful state that we in. Our pitiful state, when we see how pitiful, weak we are, how defiled we are, how depraved we are, how we have been manipulated by sin, how we have been controlled by this vicious spirit, and how it is actually impoverishing us to live a life that God intends for us to live. God wishes for us to be, listen, conquerors, more than a conqueror. He's called us to be kings. He called us to be priests. He called us to be the anointed servants of the Lord. He wants us to be clean and undefiled. He wants us to experience all that life has to offer us. So it means at the same time, although God is wanting to extend mercies to us, we must cry out for mercy. There is no way that a man that realizes how pitiful that he is or, or, the, or the, the sentence that awaits him not to cry out for leniency. Someone who has a heart, if you have a heart of stone, you'll miss it and you'll continue in that sin. Listen, God is here tonight to turn the stony hard hearts into hearts of flesh. Hearts that can receive. Heart that can feel him. Hearts that know that he exists and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. We often use that scripture as it pertains to the righteous. But God is also calling the unrighteous to understand that they can touch his heart when he is right. Listen, when Jesus Christ talks about mercy in the New Testament, he begins a doctrine that they had never heard before. The Pharisees and the Sadducees were upset with the fact that not 
only did he proclaim this doctrine, but he lived this doctrine, and he also actually showed forth that doctrine. When he went to sup with sinners, when he communicated with sinners, when he fellowshiped with sinners, when he forgave sinners of their sins, when he healed those who had palsy, those who had blindnesses, those who had uh, diseases of, of leprosy and things of that nature, and when he even said to them, go and sin no more, he brought about a doctrine that now the Son of Man has the power to extend the mercies of God on earth and have the power of that mercy backs up that person or his words and immediately forgive that person perpetually. The Pharisees could not understand the mindset that he was living in or existing in. They were so deep and steep in their traditions and their doctrines and their religiosity. Let me state this, because religiosity will never release someone from the burden of guilt. Religiosity always seeks to condemn, manipulate, control, which we talked about earlier, and always gives the air and, and the arrogancy and the pride that they are always right before God. None of them can receive the mercies of God. It takes humility to receive the mercies of God. Religiosity is a mindset that is steeped in pride and arrogancy. But yet, true religion comes from the heart where it causes the person to see and understand that there is a greater force and substance far greater than I. That I must humble my soul and my spirit to, that I can open up my soul and my spirit to receive from all about sal all of salvation is about receiving. It's about being receptive. It's about being open. It's about casting off and casting aside. It's about having a change mindset that we will never allow anything to enter into our space or our mind that is vile, that is nasty, that is deceitful, that is deceptive in nature because mercy will never accept it or embrace those things. Mercy only accepts and responds to truth. And understand, in this particular chapter 6 of, of the Psalms, David was crying out for mercy. He needed the mercies of God. Listen, some of you that are watching are dealing with court cases. You're dealing with charges that were brought against you. You're dealing with almost potential foreclosure of your property. You have prayed, you have fasted, you've asked the Lord to do some things for you. Some of you are praying for even some children that are strung out on heroin, drug, cocaine, opioids, and things of that nature. Strong narcotics that are keeping them bound into sin and controlled by the substance abuse spirit, by the spirit of pharmacia that is still residing on the inside of their hearts, their mind, and their spirit. They have tried everything to break free from it. You have prayed every prayer that you know that is imaginable to pray for them. But the thing that you really need to do is tap into the mercies of God. God to break those spirits of addiction, those habitual habits that have been going on for quite a number of years that cannot be broken, and even the enemy's plot and scheme against you. God is looking for someone to fully understand that mercy is powerful, that mercy is complete, that mercy is thorough, and when you throw yourself at the mercies of the court, you're throwing yourself at the mercy and the will and the mindset of the judge. And we're talking here about the judge supreme, the judge eternal, the judge everlasting, the judge who is all powerful, the judge who knows all things, the judge that can speak a word and everything that is that needs to be dealt with is dealt with momentarily and instantaneously. When the mercies of God are applied and applicable to our lives, it is transformative. We've used that word over a period of weeks now. But everything about God is transformative. He is here to transform us forever. 
He is here to transform our lives. He is here to overturn circumstances. He is here to expose the enemy. In this case, David was being pursued or chased by the enemy. And he says, my soul also is vexed. But thou, O Lord, how long? In verse 3. But he says, return, O Lord, deliver my soul. O save me for thy mercy's sake. In other words, for your gratefulness, for your thankfulness, for your pity, for your loving kindness, all of those things, God, do it for me, but do it for the glory and honor of who you are. Let me tell you, when God extends mercies, it is just not about us. It is not just for us to bask and relish in the mercies of the Lord momentarily. It is for us to, to share forth or to share forth the glory of what God has done. Listen, God has an ego. That ego he has is, is stroked by us when we praise and we worship God and we speak highly and favorably of him. Listen, there isn't a whole lot of favorable, favorable talk about God these days. You can go amongst the sanctified and you can hear it, but yet even it's selective, even amongst us those that are sanctified. Yes, I put it out there, I called this out, yes I said it, but it's the truth of the matter. Sometimes I listen to some Christians talk, and we are just as worse off and just as pitiful than those who are in the world. The Bible says that we are, we are without hope, we are amongst all men most miserable. So sometimes we act as though we have no hope. We act as though God is not for us. We act as though the world is against us and God's power is weak and frail and can't do anything about it. There is no need to call upon the mercies of God if you're doubting his power, if you're doubting his strength, and you don't believe that he will answer you. You must believe in the depths of your spirit and the depths of your soul and the depths of your mind that when you hold communication with God, that God is going to answer you. You must believe without anything doubting. You must believe without anything in fear and without holding anything in reservation. I often tell people continuously over and over again, prayer is not about the antics. Prayer is about the sincerity of the heart. He wants you to communicate with him, talk to him. He wants you to have fellowship with him. Hold a conversation with God like you would anyone else, but yet understand the reverence that, of, that he needs to be afforded. He wants you to come to him and talk to him out of the very depths of your heart, out of the very depths of your soul. Listen, one of the major blockers of mercy being extended and help being extended towards us is our lack of truthfulness. We hide the facts. No, we need to share the facts. Hold an analogy of what's going on in your mind. Think about those things that are imp impacting you, those things that have been imparted unto you, and how they make you feel in the very present. Listen, you are already feeling that way. So why not express and explain to God exactly where you are? These are the things that are transpired. These are the things that the enemy has done. These are the thoughts that the enemy has placed in my mind. These are the things that I've entertained willfully. These are the places that I want to go, the people that I want to do it with. These are the things that I have in my mind, God. But God, unless you help me, I will not be free from these things. Being real with God actually motivates him or moves his mercies far more so than us hiding the facts and the detail. Listen, he's omniscient, meaning he knows every single thing. He knows everything that there is to know about you. He knows everything that you would ever want to know about yourself. He knows things about you that you don't even know about yourself. But yet, when we are open and honest before his holy presence, and when we share with him the things that we enjoy, the pleasure that we get out of it, although we know that it's wrong, although the mindset, think about it, even being vindictive towards someone else and wanting to carry out that vindication ourselves. The Bible says, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, I will repay. God never wants you to pay, take vengeance in your own hand. Listen, I'm talking to the vengeful people. Some of you have even begun to plot and plan and scheme. And some of you have even pinned it out. 
Some of you have even started initiating some of the things that you want to put into practice or to do to others. Listen, God has a word for you. Stop. Desist. Scrap your plans. Throw them away. Put them in the trash. Burn them up. Don't come to them again. And place everything in the hands of God. Asking for his mercy. Listen, when we ask for mercy, we really are asking God to help us to repent. We're asking God to forgive us. To remove those ill ways of thinking out of our hearts, out of our minds, and out of our soul. You want a prophetic word? Well, I just gave you one. God said, get rid of all the dross. Get rid of your plots, your schemes, and your plan. Yes, we look for prophetic words to be blessings. God bless me with a house. Bless me with a husband. Bless me with a wife. Make my pocketbook fat. But sometimes God want to make your spirit man fat. He wants to make your heart fat towards him. He wants to make you rich in mercy. He wants to make you rich in loving kindness. He wants to make you rich in the things that we repel. We don't want to be like the church of Laodicea. They were rich with wealthy, wealthy church, had many things, materialistically. And we're living in a very materialistic society. Matter of fact, a couple of weeks ago, I was out at an event, and I had a, the person that drove up was a pastor's ch a child. Uh, I'm not going to go into any further detail, but they drove up in this $300,000 car convertible, and yet they were so, so impressed and talked boastfully throughout the entire evening about the things that they had. No one ever inquired about it. No one ever asked, but they were talking about all these expensive items that they had, and my spirit was sitting there just grieved. What does it profit a man to gain the whole world, but yet lose his very soul? Is your trust in the things, or is your trust in God? The thing is, God will make us wealthy in spiritual things, and he would also make us prosper in the natural things, if we honor him first. The Bible says very clearly, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all of these things will be added unto you. God wants us to crave that which is important and most important above all things. And those things really are the spiritual things that keeps us rooted, grounded, and focused on the real thing. Eternity is our state. We're going to walk in the presence of God for all eternity. We're going to see streets of ghosts that are translucent. The purest form that there ever could be, communicating the purity of God and to com and to convey the fact that he has the power to redeem, he has the power to save, and he is a royal authority, a king of kings and a lord of lords. The thing is this, what do we really want out of this life? We should be craving the mercies of God for eternity to come. Not making preparations to stay here. Yes, understand we have to work, we must eat, we must be clothed, we must have transportation, we must have the basic necessities of life. Maslow's hierarchy of needs actually indicates that and state that. We definitely have needs. But listen, our need is for God. When we are transformed and we are saved, our desire for God should intensify. Listen. The intensity of faith has not really been manifested and displayed the way that the older saints used to manifest faith. How they used to believe God for every single thing and believe God even if time stated it was against it. They did not understand time based upon their experience with God. And we're so caught up, listen, in the microwave environment that we miss the fact that God is not confined to the time limitations that we exist in. When we understand the mercies of God, it is for a specific timing. And when the timing comes forth, then everything else precedes it, comes along with it, is attached to it. When we pray for things to happen and mercy is attached to it, listen, favor comes along with it. 
Favor comes along with it. The anointing comes along with it. Change comes along with it. Shackles are broken and destroyed. Prisoners are set free. People are made happy. The joy of the Lord is extended. Happiness comes forth. And the exuberance of the Holy Spirit manifested within our lives. The full manifestation because of the mercies of the Lord that are extended. Listen, David went on to say that his eyes were consumed because of his enemy. Listen, when the mercies of God are extended, <laughs> I love this one because the Lord just proved this to me over the past couple of days. Listen, whenever the enemies are against you, the enemies of the Lord, and your enemies are against you naturally as well as spiritually, when God extends mercy towards you because you have weeped, you have wailed, you have cried, you have felt the pressure. Some of you, some of you have been in the pressure cooker of life recently. And listen, God is saying your weeping and your tears have come up before my presence as a memorial. It is standing before me in bottles. I hear your tears. I see your tears. And every single drop that you cry was a prayer in my presence. Listen, when God recognizes your prayers and he extends mercy towards your prayer, every enemy that has set up a trap for you, listen, is exposed. Every plot is revealed. And listen. The enemy in this instance, when God extends mercy, tells on themselves. You don't need anybody else to expose the plot, the scheme, or the plans of God. The enemy himself will tell you what his plots and schemes are. I just had it happen to me realistically within the past couple of days. A person in their haste exposed themselves and told the full details where they were plotting and scheming against myself and someone else, but yet in their anger and their haste, and because I believe prayer and God dealt with them and made them expose themselves. Listen, the enemies that are trying to tear you down will expose their plotting schemes to persons unbeknownst to them that are aware of what they're attempting to do. And they will be able to counteract by the spirit and the mind of God and to pray and to expose them so that God himself will bring down the plots of the enemy and the ditch that they've dug for you. Listen, they have successfully dug it for themselves. They have laid out their own demise, their own scheme. And listen, the power of their plot and their schemes will be sucked out of it, just like air in a balloon. It will float off into the expanse of nothingness. And will not be able to be forged against you. Listen, the Bible says this. The weapon will be forged, but it shall not prosper. Some of us are crying over the forging of the weapon. I don't care what furnace they forge this iron in. I don't care who they assign to be a part of this scheme. I don't even care about their intellectual abilities and their ability to put things together at the highest of levels. Listen, when God says something will not prosper, mercy backs it up and says it will never even get off the ground. It will never even move from the planning stages and into the place where it's being acted upon. It will be throttled. it will be destroyed, it will be demolished long before they even have an opportunity. I don't care what their title is, I don't care what their position is, I don't care how many demons are associated with it. I don't care how many witches they even involve in the process. Listen, witchcraft cannot prosper against the people of God. Listen, the plans of God are the only thing that will prosper. God is into blessing his people and exposing the enemy. The question is, do we realize the power of God to expose the enemy 
and to defeat him. One of the things that God loves doing is rescuing his people. There is something about the spirit of oppression that moves the heart of God to deliverance. God never wants his people to be oppressed, depressed, possessed, or controlled. He wants his people to be set at liberty. One of the things that really bothers me over and over again in my even my profession, I have opportunity to speak with people that go through numerous types of challenges in life. Some of them are extremely devastating. Some of them are extremely hard. And one of the things that always bothers me, grieves me, and vexes my spirit at its very core is the fact that they're dealing with this spirit of oppression. God has come to set the captive at liberty. Listen. You do not have to sit in the place of despondency or despair and eat the bread thereof. That is not something that was baked for you. Yes, the enemy has served it up, and some of us have purchased it from the menu of his, del of his delicious items. But the spirit of oppression and depression and possession is never something that God wants his people to be involved in or entangled in or snare. Mercy is always there as the spirit of deliverance. David talked about it even in this particular chapter. He said, let all my enemies be ashamed and sore vexed. Let them return. Listen, let them return and be ashamed suddenly. Listen. We don't want the enemy to be ashamed over a period of time. We want the impact of what he has attempted to do to hit him quickly. Hit him like a ton of bricks. To send him not only reeling, but a knockout. We don't want a TKO. No, we want God to knock him out. Knock out his power. Knock out his strength. And expose him, sin a reeling, suddenly. Listen, when someone is hit and knocked out, it is a sudden thing. And when they wake up, they're dazed. They're trying to figure out well, what in the world just happened. Well, you just got knocked out. Uh, so, <laughs> so the thing is, that's how the God wants the devil to be. He wants him to be knocked out to the point that when he wakes up, he has to realize what power hit me. <laughs> the power of God. That's what power hits you. Listen, the power of God still does exist. The power of God still does exist. Listen, I've listened to a group of young people talk over the past couple of weeks about how they're disgruntled or they can't experience the power of God. Listen, maybe you're hanging out with the wrong people or attending the wrong church. You need to get with someone who has fasted, someone who has prayed, someone who is on fire for the Lord, someone who believes this thing with all their heart, with all their soul, with all their might, and are living this thing and have a connection with God. And are able by the power of God. I talked earlier about the angelic beings that back up the man or the woman of God. That have angels standing at the ready. Hallelujah, Jesus. On command by God. When the word starts coming out, the power of God goes forth. Why? Because the angels of God are encircling the holies of holies in the holy place. And when we communicate the word of the Lord, we are being transformed. We use that word over and over again tonight. You are transformed out of this natural natural state, and you are immediately transported into the kingdom of righteousness. That's why it's so important that we reverence and take serious the word of the Lord. It is not a life thing for us just to hear the word of God, but we must understand the spiritual activity associated with the declaration and the proclamation of the word of God. We're just not preaching a word idly. We're preaching the word so that the mercies of God will come forth and your life will be better, that you will be blessed by the power of the living and the true God. See, if these young people, as well as us older people and us that are older or seasoned, can get back to the very essence of the heart in the mind of God. What is the heart in the mind of God? 
that he be worshipped in a pure atmosphere. And that the very presence of the Lord can be felt. I've shared multiple times on this line. And I feel compelled to share it again tonight. When I first, before I came to salvation, my mom had asked me to go to church with her. It was an apostolic church. And, 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 and she kept asking me over and over again. I was in the service. And when I would come home on the weekend, I was about doing my own thing. I wanted to party. But she wanted me to go to church with her in my uniform. So I said, okay, mom, I consent. I go. I yield. So when I got there with her, the power, let me tell you, the power of God was so strong that I squirmed the entire time in my seat. I was looking for the nearest exit. And hear this. I was praying to God whose presence I was feeling and experienced for the service to be over with. It seemed like the more I prayed for the service to be over, the longer the service seemed to go on. And the people of God, which I never experienced before, was so enthusiastic, so excited, so exuberant and celebrative. Where they worshipped everything that was going on, every song they sang. It's like they were into it with all their hearts, all their minds, with all their souls. And I just could not understand these people. I was coming from a boring Baptist church. Okay, I know there's probably some Baptists on the phone, on the line. I'm not trying to offend. I'm trying to share my experience. But yet... The thing that got me over a year later after my mom passed is that I knew that there was something about the way that she lived and worshipped. And I recall feeling the very presence of the Lord, something that I had never experienced. And I craved and I want that, wanted that. Listen, we have to create an atmosphere in our places of worship, in our church services, where the people that come in that are broken, that are lost, that are hurting, that are in pain, that need the mercies of God to deliver them, can not only hear about God, but experience God by feeling him in the place of worship. Understand that God really wants us to experience him, <clears throat> excuse me, at his best. He never wishes for anyone to come into a place of worship and leave without knowing that he exists. The Bible said that he exists and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. How can we know that he exists unless we feel his presence? You never know that I existed until you saw my image. But yet, if you were in my presence, you would have the opportunity to touch my hand, to embrace me, to communicate the same to me to you. But yet, we understand through this venue of media and cameras and things of that nature and social media that we can reach out and see our brothers or our sister. But God is a very present help, the Bible tells us. So we must feel his presence. We need to pray to the level of intensity. That anyone that wishes to feel the presence of the Lord can feel him, know him, and know that this power exists in the earth and in the heavenly realms. Most people don't believe God exists because they never had an encounter with him. It is so easy to become disillusioned and not believe when you don't have that type of encounter with the Lord. We need to pray that the people of God have an experience and an encounter with the Lord. We want to continue our conversation, but our time is up. For any of those that wish to dialogue with us, continuing after the, for this few moments, we're going to reconvene in just a few moments, but you can call 910-218-0531. That's God in Life's prayer line. If you want prayer, you want to talk, you want to share with us, we want to communicate with you. We love the dialogue. Amen. And we're usually on this line uh, pretty late. So please call, uh, share with us what you want to share with us. Let us know where you are. Listen, we are all in this thing together. There is no big I or no little you. We are not here to condemn you. We're here to love you. And we're here to point you in one direction. To Jesus Christ, the master, the gift of God, 
who has the full extent and full power of mercy in his hands and in his bosom. Listen, if you don't want to come on the, the, on the prayer line and call in before you leave, I want you to know this, that God loves you and he cares about you and he's concerned about every aspect of of your life. Never believe the lies of the devil that he's that God is saying to you that he could kill us. That is not the God that we serve. His mercy proves that he cares. Again, if you want to call in and continue the dialogue with us, the phone number to call in just a very few moments is 910-218-0531. Once again, 910-218. 0531. We love you with the love of the Lord. We bless you. Every Wednesday night at this time, we will be here from 9 p.m. until the preaching or the conclusion of the preached word of God. God bless you. We love you. Have a wonderful week in the Lord. And we look forward to hearing from you because Jesus is Lord and Lord of all. Have a wonderful evening. God bless each and every one of you.